has enticed philosophers for centuries. It's called the mind-body problem. And it asks, what is the relationship between the thoughts in our minds and the brains in our heads? Is mind stuff different from brain stuff? Maybe gray matter is all that matters. Or do minds have existence outside the brain, beyond what's crammed into our craniums? Today, brains and minds make for hot debate. So what's so special about the human brain compared to the brains of chimps and dolphins? And what about the artificial brains of computers? Next, on Closer to Truth, do brains make minds? Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm Robert Kuhn. Modern brain research, called neuroscience, explains how we sense, think, feel, and behave. But can neuroscience solve the mind-body problem? Our guest experts bring us a wide variety of views on gray and other matter. Dr. Barry Beierstein is professor of neuropsychology at Simon Fraser University in Canada. Dr. John Searle is professor of philosophy at Berkeley and the author of numerous books about the mind. Dr. Marilyn Schlitz is an anthropologist and experimental parapsychologist. Dr. David Chalmers is a philosopher at the University of Arizona. And Dr. Fred Allen Wolf is a theoretical physicist and author of books about consciousness. Barry, you're a materialist who believes that only the physical is real. Does that mean that you believe that mind is the output of the brain, just like urine is the output of the kidney? To the extent that to both the brain and the kidney are physical organs, they both have, have anatomical structures and, and uh, physical relationships that generate uh, particular things, uh, yes, the output of one is urine and the output of the other is thought. John, you're one of the leading philosophers of mind. You've written a book, The Rediscovery of the Mind, putting the mind on the front burner. What do you make of the increasing confidence, some would call it arrogance, of brain scientists, neuroscientists like Barry here, who are virtually asserting that they've solved the mind-body problem? I don't think they're asserting that. I, I, I'm sorry that uh, Barry's so down on uh, kidneys, but I do think that, we, that he would agree with me that we have a long way to go in understanding how the brain works. Uh, we're only beginning to understand how the brain works. Now, there are really two mind-body problems. One is the overall philosophical question. What are the general relationships between the mind and the brain? And I think now we can say what those are. The brain processes cause mental states. Mental states are realized in the brain. But the hard question, what, what Dave calls the, the hard question, how exactly does it work? We don't know the answer to that. Marilyn, you're a director of research at the Noetic Institutes. You're an anthropologist. How do you hear these different shades of materialism and how does, that, how does that impact the work that you've done? I think that I would take the position of a radical empiricist and to say that there are ways in which people's experience refutes what we understand from the reductionist and materialist science and that there are data, solid concrete data, that suggest that our consciousness, our mind may uh, surpass the boundaries of the mind or of the brain. So I think it's important that we keep a fairly open-minded perspective. Dave, your book, The Conscious Mind, makes the case for the mind and consciousness being a primary element of reality. What could brain research discover to make you change your mind and discard the mind as a primary element of reality and realize that you should have been a good old materialist all along, just like Barry? Well, I started off life as a materialist, and uh, materialism is a very attractive uh, scientific and philosophical doctrine. But what brain research is giving us is a set of really systematic correlations between events in the brain and states of mind. You'll find that this kind of area of visual cortex, for example, is associated with certain kinds of visual experiences. But correlation isn't the same as explanation or reduction. I think there's actually systematic reasons to think we, you're always going to need a substantive bridge between these two different domains. So you're saying that it's logically impossible for any data in brain research to make you change your mind? Brain research is providing more and more data about the correlations. 
The question about how you interpret the data is always a philosophical question. Barry, are you more open-minded than Dave? Could you see any data that could occur that would make you realize that materialism, radical materialism, is not the right philosophy, but that there is something more to the human mind than what's in the human brain? Well, I actually agree with David. You know, I think it's a philosophical question, and you know, I go back to Gertrude Stein, who said, you know, uh, difference isn't a difference unless it makes a difference, and and so. Oh, um, I, I agree with most of what, what David said, that um, I can't see anything that we need yet to um, bring in from the outside to explain anything in neuroscience, uh, and I'm going to push that as far as it will go, and, and conceivably someday I'll come up against something that doesn't fit, and, and I'll have to change my mind. Fred, you have written as a physicist books on the spiritual universe, the dreaming universe, what do you have that doesn't fit Barry's worldview? Almost everything. <laughs> the, the idea, in, in many ways, I, I, I agree with, with David that there is really no way that materialism is going to explain consciousness. Uh, it's correlate. It, 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 it's, it's a necessary correlation in much the same way that an automobile can drive from one place to another place because there's a driver behind it. Uh, I see reality differently. I would say that it's more like a dreaming reality, that there's a dreamer or a, a great spirit, and that we are all part of that, a dream dreaming. I, and I think that model can lead to some real scientific breakthroughs rather than attempting to try to reduce everything down to the simplest. John, does that sound like a ghost in a machine I, to you? I think this whole debate so far is totally misconceived, and I can't resist saying at least a little bit why. Of course we're going to find correlations. But then the next step is, as with the germ theory of disease, find out causal relations. In, in the case of, of uh, the germ theory of disease, first we found correlations. I, I mean, uh, uh, Semmel Weiss in Vienna with his, with his obstetrics patients, he just found the correlation. Then you find the causal relation, then you find a causal mechanism. Now that's how we're going to do it in brain research. And I think when we do that, then all these old-fashioned categories about is it sufficiently materialistic or is it really dualistic, those will just fall by the wayside. Consciousness is not going to be reducible to mental states for a kind of trivial reason. Namely, it's got a first-person ontology. It only exists when people experience it. It's subjective in that sense, and brain states are objective. So you don't get a reduction in the classical sense, but you still get, you still get a scientific explanation. That's all that I think any one of you guys really wants. Marilyn, do you agree with me that John is a closet materialist? No, well, I'm not sure he's a closet materialist. I think he's, he's pretty out, of the out, in, the, uh, the out in the open. Uh, I mean, for me, I think that there's just a really compelling body of data to suggest that uh, we can uh, supersede our brain and move our awareness, our sense of self, out into the world in ways that aren't easily reducible to the brain state. And I think that data needs to be accommodated by the neuroscience perspective if we're to have a complete uh, science of the brain as equivalent to the mind. I don't know what it's going to end up with. As See, I hear Marilyn day. saying something very strong. I, I hear her saying that brain science has to accommodate itself to other data outside the neurosciences as, as it's currently constituted to make a true picture of reality. I think that's right. A complete and integral science has to really speak to the data of everyday experience rather than uh, supposing we can fit everything into a specific but I think she's saying reductionist something even, model. Even stronger than it's that. Namely, that you can have experiences outside the brain. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see any evidence for those. But I would say we got our hands full now trying to figure out uh, the experiences that we know go on in the brain. If I had a pretty, if I had a theory of how the brain causes experience, I'd feel that was a pretty good day's work. Then if somebody wants to go on and say, now figure out how there can be experiences outside the brain, okay, that's for tomorrow. No, no, but if, if you can have data that some people believe that show that there are qu uh, quantifiable, uh, scientifically determined events outside that, that changes your whole approach to the uh, whole subject. Of course. If, if you're if ignoring you, the good stuff you and had, focusing on the easy stuff. If you had some really conclusive data, but there's nothing in the, in the, uh, uh, the neuroscience literature that I know of that says there are conclusive data for out-of-body conscious experiences. You've got to read outside you don't, neuroscience. You don't want to exclude the